overarching the whole of the Bible is God's gracious desire and intention to have a binding, lasting relationship with human beings. The word for this is covenant. The covenant. And God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. We thought about that this morning as we thought about his faithfulness. And there's a, there's a, a refrain that expresses this that is found across the whole of the scriptures, including in our passage. And it's there in verse 12. This is in the section, Blessings for Obedience, verse 12. And the Lord says this, And I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. You see, God promises to be their God and they will be his people. That's the language of God making a binding relationship, a covenant with people. Now, those words are very similar, are found in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. And they're actually found partially in Genesis 17, verse 8. So they're found right at the beginning of the Bible. And they're wonderfully fulfilled in the end of the Bible. So turn with me to Revelation 21, where these, this echo of God uh, saying he will be his, uh, our God and we will be his people is, is fulfilled in the new heavens and the new earth. So Revelation 21, the last but one chapter of the entire Bible, page 1041. I'll just read a few verses, verses 1 to 4. John writes this in his vision of that future. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God with his, is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. That's the great consummation of God's covenant that we have to look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth. So in other words, there's a great unity of purpose across the whole of the Bible. God wanting a people for himself, wanting to create a covenant people for whom he will be their God and they will be his people. And that is across the whole of the Bible, even across the whole of history, even into the world to come, even across the ages everlasting that are to come. But there's also a distinction between God's working out of that covenant between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you were to turn to page 804, which you can if you like, what you will find is that in your left hand, you'll have something very different from what's in your right hand. In your left hand, you will have the Old Testament, also known as the Old Covenant. And in your right hand, you will have the New Testament, or the New Covenant. Have you turned to page 84? I think there's a blank page, isn't it, pretty much? But you get the idea. In your left hand, you've got the Old Covenant. In your right hand, you've got the New Covenant. There is, in other words, as well as this unity of God wanting to carve out form, forge this people for himself, across the whole of the Bible, there is also a distinction to be made between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Now, there are debates as to whether the, there is one covenant in two dispensations or two covenants. I won't get into that this evening. That would not be enlightening or helpful. This evening, we're exploring the distinctions between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. But I want to see that that's under the, the unity of purpose that God has to have a people for himself across the whole of the, the Bible. And as we explore the distinctions between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, what I particularly want to preach is how these, how these distinctions meet together beautifully and just mesh wonderfully at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where the Old Covenant, as described in our passage, is fulfilled and the New Covenant is established. And it all just fits together beautifully at the old uh, at, the, at this junction of the two, at the cross of the Lord Jesus. The Old and New Covenants are different by design. It's, we should not think that God had a change of mind. He, he sort of started with, with the Old Covenant and then went to the New Covenant. No, that's not the way it is. The New Covenant is not a plan B. The New Covenant was the plan A from the start. 
and it's in fact announced all the way through the Old Covenant. It's prophesied and promised uh, and, promised and um, foreshadowed in many different ways. So the New Covenant's not a plan B, it's the eternally ordained plan A. And broadly speaking, the distinction between these two covenants, which we have to get our heads around because otherwise we will completely misunderstand our passage. Broadly speaking, the distinction is the Old Covenant is about justice and the New Covenant is about grace. God desired to show grace, also known as undeserved kindness, to the world, but in a way that was manifestly just. And so the new covenant comes having, with the old covenant having already been put in place. The justice is the context for the new covenant. And the whole plan, as I say, beautifully comes together, harmonizes at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we're going to look at this evening is, first of all, the distinctives of the Old Covenant, because that is what our passage confronts us with. And if and unless we um, get to grips with this and put it in its biblical picture properly, but we'll completely misunderstand our passage and go away and start trying earning our salvation. And then having looked at that, we'll then come to the New Covenant, uh, which, which, uh, which we'll be crying out for, in fact, uh, by the time we've looked at the Old Covenant. So that's, that's broadly speaking where we're going this evening. So first of all then, what's distinctive about the old covenant that contrasts with the new? It's this. Back in our passage, it's that blessings are, re- it's that God rewards the obedience of his law with blessing and the disobedience of his law with punishments. It's really very straightforward. So there are blessings for obedience in the old covenant and there are punishments for disobedience. That's just the, the basics of justice, isn't it? And so the blessings, uh, as our ESV headings show us, the blessings are outlined from verses 3 down to verse 13. Let me just give a flavor of those again. Notice the first word. First word of verse 3. That's the key word. Key word. If, if, if you walk in my statutes, says the Lord, and observe my commandments and do them, then... I will give you your rains in their season. We might think that doesn't sound very good, but if you're living in a dry land, as we've maybe experienced actually, rains in their season are just what you need for the crops to grow. I will give you rains in their season, and the land shall yield its increase, and the trees of the field shall increase, uh, shall yield their fruit. Verse 6, I will give, you, uh, I'll give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. Verse 7, you shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you. And so it goes on. Those are the blessings. And they're all dependent on the if of verse 3. If you obey the Lord's laws. The punishments are outlined from verses 14 downwards. So let me just give a little flavor of this. But if, there's another if, but it's the other way around now. But if you will not listen to me, says the Lord, And will not do all these commandments if you spurn my statutes and your soul abhors my rules so that you will not do all my commandments but break my covenant. Then I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever that consumes the eyes and makes the heart ache. You shall sow your seed in vain for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you and you shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you and you shall flee when none pursues you. And so it goes on. And here, the if that all of this is under, that's in verse 14, is the opposite way around. And that if, in fact, gets repeated several times in this whole block of the punishments for disobedience. Now, we see the same things. Uh, the same pattern in Deuteronomy chapter 28. In fact, just turn there with me. Deuteronomy 28 is on page 168. And, uh, and this, in a sense, shows that the importance of our law. Deuteronomy is, is the, the climax of the Torah, the, the, the law of the Old Testament. And this is pretty much the climax of Deuteronomy, the, sort of the, the, the big denouement, the big ending. Here's what you have to do. Here's what you need to know. And so our chapter, uh, sorry, this chapter is very similar to our chapter. You can see even from the, uh, from the headings in the ESV. Blessings for obedience, verse 1. Verse 15, curses for disobedience. Let me just give you a little brief flavor of this. Deuteronomy 28. 
And if you, verse 1, and if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I will command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the field, and blessed shall you be, uh, sorry, blessed in, in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, and, the, and of your young and at the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket in your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. And so it goes on. Beautiful, pouring out of God's blessing, if they obey his laws. And then the second part, verse 15. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and they're called curses here they're not called curses in our passage but they're called curses here and this word is going to be key uh, because it the new testament will refer to it so uh, uh, verse 16 cursed shall you be in the city cursed shall you be in the field cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl cursed shall be the fruit of your ro- your womb and the fruit of your ground the increase of your herds and of your young uh, the young of your flock Cursed shall you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. And on it goes at great length. The curses for disobeying God's old covenant. Now, what do you notice about the section on the curses for disobedience as compared with the blessings for obedience? The curses for disobedience are very, very long. But a rough rule of thumb, I mean, I literally just went like that on the, on the text. I think they're about four times longer in Deuteronomy 28, roughly, in terms of the number of lines of text. It's about four times longer, the curses for disobedience, than the blessings for obedience. Now, why is that? Well, I'll tell you why it's not. It's certainly not because God enjoys cursing more than blessing. That is not what's going on here. Rather, it's because disobedience was the path that God's people would take in the old covenant. And so they desperately needed to hear the curses that they would incur, the curses that they would bring on themselves if they go down this path of disobedience. God is graciously telling them, warning them, this is what you will face. That's the path they went down. In fact, Old Testament history is the story of rebellion again and again. The rebellion of Israel against God. Not because Israel were any worse than any other nation of the human race, but rather the whole human race since Genesis 3 has turned away from God, turned into sin, turned in on ourselves, turned against God. And, uh, and so since the fall, all of us, the natural descendants of Adam, do not have the power or the inclination to obey God. And so actually Old Testament history is the outworking of the curses of the law that's in our passage and in Deuteronomy chapter 28. There were moments of blessing, but I think maybe we could more ascribe them to God's grace, really. The particularly obvious outworkings of the law's curses came in the exiles. Uh, at one point in Old Testament history, the, 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 um, the people of God is divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom, Israel, uh, go into exile into Assyria, and that happens in 2 Kings uh, chapter 17. And the southern kingdom, Judah, they go into exile in Babylon, and that's narr- foretold and narrated in Jeremiah and also in 2 Kings. And in fact, if you were to read Deuteronomy, cha- well, the second part of Deuteronomy 28, the, 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 the curses part, curses for disobedience, it reads very much as a prediction of the exile. In fact, at some points it will stop using language of if and start using language of because you will do this. Because of that, this is what you will face. There is a foreknowledge here that this is the path they're going to go down. So actually our passage is is key for understanding the whole of the Old Old Testament history. And we can see actually Daniel looking back on our passage and on probably Deuteronomy 28, centuries later in exile and referring to it. Just look at Daniel chapter 9 with me. It's on page 747. 
Daniel 9, just read a few verses. Let me read verses 10 to 12a. This is a great prayer of Daniel. He's, he's, they're drawing to the end of the 70 years of exile, and he sees that the people's, his own uh, sin is still there, and the people's sin is still there, and, and, and what's going to happen now? And so it's, it's a great prayer of confession. He pours out to the Lord, and he refers to our passage, Daniel chapter 9, verse, verses 10 to 12. Let me just read that. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses, i.e. our passage and Deuteronomy 28, that curse that's written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we've sinned against him. He's confirmed his words. He's confirmed his law that's in our passage. He's confirmed it, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. He's praying there from Babylon. That's what he's talking about. So what does all this tell us? It tells us this. There's no hope of us obeying our way to heaven. It's ruled out. It's a non-starter. It's never going to happen for any of us. That's what the whole Old Testament law and hist- subsequent history is a demonstration of. There is no hope of us obeying our way to heaven. So we see this failure. We've seen it in the pages of the Bible, haven't we? We've seen it um, in various places. Do you also see that in your own heart? That there's no hope of you obeying your way to heaven? Have you had hopes that you can somehow deserve your way to heaven? Do you still have hopes that you can somehow deserve your way to heaven? Because that's what this is all, to pull the rug under your feet and my feet, if that's what we're thinking. And so the challenge to us is, will we now renounce those hopes in ourselves, in any deserving, in anything that, any, any thought that we might be able to obey our way to heaven? That's what this is telling us, to renounce and totally reject Let me preach now the glorious good news that this is all crying out for, which is that there is a better covenant than the old covenant. A new and living way that God has founded on a better foundation than being dependent and conditional on our obedience, because that was never going to work, as he knew, as he wanted to manifestly show the world through the old covenant. There's a redeemer in the new covenant that there's no dependence on our our obedience. There's a new way. There's a distinction now. The the, the way of our passage is, is replaced by something else, a new, better way. There's going to be a redeemer who removes the curse of the law for those who trust in him. There's going to be a new covenant in which God remembers sins no more. And in fact, when in this in this new covenant, he writes his law in our heart. He writes his ways in our heart by his spirit so that we won't go astray from him. There is a righteousness from God to be obtained apart from the law, Romans 3.21. Apart from any striving to obey the law. And that's the blessed good news of Jesus Christ. And the glorious key passage that, in a sense, is the New Testament answer to the blessings for obedience, the curses for disobedience that our passage has put before us. The glorious passage is Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. So turn there with me. It's on page 973. Galatians 3. I'll read from verse 10, okay? Sorry, Akeen, if I've confused. Um, So I'll read from verse 10, but verse 13 is the the key. I'll read from verse 10 because you will hear echoes of what we've been thinking about from our passage in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. uh, Galatians 3, verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. Yeah, the curse for disobedience. That's the curse that's proclaimed in our passage and in Deuteronomy 28. 
For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. That's the old covenant in a nutshell for you there. Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Now look at verse 13. That's the key one. Do you see there a mention of the curse of the law? Have you ever read that verse and wondered what that was and thought that sounded a bit odd? Well, hopefully now you understand what it's talking about. It's talking about the punishment that our sin is due. The curse is for disobedience that the law pronounces as we looked at. And it's saying that the Lord Jesus Christ has redeemed, in other words, has freed us from it by becoming that curse for us, us being the people of the new covenant. We'll look at that in a moment. But, but the point is that Christ has redeemed people from that curse, the, the, the punishment that their sin is due, by becoming that curse on their behalf, for their sake. So what is it, what is it saying? It is, it, it's saying that Christ was hanged on a tree. What's the relevance of that? Well, in, in um, Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, which is the bit where it says, it is written, um, it, it says there that anyone who's hanged on a tree is under God's curse. So as Jesus is crucified on a tree or some sort of pole or, or stake or something like that, he is manifestly cursed by God. He's cursed by God, and yet, in receiving the curse of God, he's doing so in order to redeem us, in order to free us from the curse that is ours, is rightly deserved by us. So this magnificent verse proclaims the justice of God, and yet the grace of God. Because the curse of the law is not just dropped. The curse of the law is born, taken by the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of those whom he came to save. And so do you see the glorious mercy and grace of God in this? Under the terms of the old covenant, we've each incurred the curse of God for our sin. Without the new covenant, we would be inexorably heading for that curse everlastingly in hell. But in the new covenant, Christ comes and bears the curse for his people. He redeems us from its misery by receiving it in himself on the cross. And so you can go and read the huge long section of curses in Deuteronomy 20, uh, 28. Massive number of verses. And you can thank God at every point that every curse that's represented by those endless verses has been born on your behalf by the Lord Jesus Christ if you are trusting in him for your salvation. And more than that, Christ, by his righteous life, he lived a perfect life. He lived a life that deserves and merits the blessings for obedience. The first part of our chapter. And that's manifestly shown as he's resurrected from the, from the dead and exalted and honored at God's right hand. What does the gospel proclaim there for those who trust in Christ? It proclaims that that righteousness, that vindication, that declaration of, of acceptability in God's sight that is there at the resurrection, that is for us too who believe in him. So Jesus comes, lives the perfect life, merits all the blessings of the old covenant, but actually suffers the curses of the old covenant, which we deserve, so that we who believe in him never face the, curse of the, the, the curses for, for our sin, but rather receive the blessings that Christ has earned by his righteousness. So do you see how Christ gloriously fulfills the terms of the old covenant of justice and at the same time in beautiful harmony, meshing perfectly together, he establishes the new covenant of absolute unconditional mercy through his death and resurrection. 
you see ho- hopefully why, why it's really important that we consider a passage like what we've, like our chapter, in the light of the whole Bible, otherwise we will go badly astray. We need to see the grace of the new covenant that supersedes the blessings and curses of the old covenant. So how then, let me just begin to wrap up. Let me begin. Um, how do we receive all the mercies of the new covenant? How do we, how do we get to be in the new covenant? I've used language of us. Um, how do we get to be? How do we get to, to, to take hold of and take possession of the mercy that's in the new covenant? Well, the answer is this. You and I need to be crucified with Christ. Now, that might sound a, an odd thing to say. It might sound a slightly obscure and enigmatic and strange answer, but it's not, and it's the Bible's own language, and it shows us how radical a thing needs to take place. And if we don't grasp this, then we may mistakenly, may mistakenly think that we have a place in the new covenant when actually the curse for our sin remains on us. So let's just try and briefly understand this. How can we be set free from the claims of God's law against our disobedience? Well, it's through Christ. How in Christ? It's by nothing less than the death of our old life, crucified with Christ, in order that we may gain a new life in Christ, lived to God's praise and glory. Galatians 2 verse 19. The Apostle Paul writes this autobiographically about his own conversion. For through the law I died to the law. Remember the law is this thing that condemns sinners. How is he freed from the law? He says he died to the law. How did he die to the law? I've been crucified with Christ. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. You see, in order to live to God, in order to have that new life, there had to be the death of the old. And that happens by being crucified with Christ. So let me ask you this. Do you want to belong to Christ? Do you want to be wedded and knit to the Lord Jesus Christ and to be freed from all the condemnation and curse that your sin deserves? Because if so, that is a wonderful desire that you have and you obtain it by humbling yourself before God, getting down on your knees before God, as it were, maybe literally, and pleading for your old life to be crucified with Christ and for a new life in his resurrection life. Have you ever prayed to God like that? Wanting that old life that you've lived, just living for yourself, to be gone, to be rid of, to be crucified with Christ, so that you have a new life in the Lord Jesus, who's resurrected. And if you've never prayed like that, I urge you to. For those who have, let me just close very briefly with a couple of New Testament passages, just for your encouragement as we come to take the Lord's Supper very shortly. Just very briefly, a couple of New Testament passages that proclaim the wonderful grace of the new covenant to encourage our souls as we come to the Lord's table. Romans 7 verse 4. I love this verse. I I probably mention it far too many times. You go, not that verse again, but I just think it's absolutely wonderful. Romans 7 verse 4. Um, Not reading quite the whole verse. It says this. You have died to the law through the body of Christ. And maybe if you think died to the law, maybe you, you, you... You might have thought, well, what's so good about that? Well, hopefully you now see what's so good about that. The law that condemns sinners. You've died to the law. This is talking to believers. You've died to the law through the body of Christ that you may belong to another, to him who's been raised from the dead, in order that you may bear fruit for God. So praise the Lord. You are no longer bound to the law and its curse on your disobedience if you're trusting in Christ. But you are now bound to Christ and to every everlasting blessing that is in him. The language is there of marriage. You are no longer married to the law that condemns you. You are married to Christ who saves you if you're trusting in him. And a second passage for your encouragement. Colossians 2 verses 13 and 14. And you 
who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. He's talking about the uh, deadness in sin. And you, God made alive together with him, with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Here we go, listen to this. By cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. That's the curses of the law against sinners. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So again, praise the Lord, all the curse of the law that we have merited and incurred by our sin. All of that that stood against us, against our record, pronounced us guilty. All of that has been nailed to the cross of Jesus. And so as we come to take the Lord's Supper, we can do so eagerly, hungrily, praisingly, thankfully. There are many more things I could add. But I think it's time to stop. Let's pray, we'll sing a hymn. And we'll come in this same frame of mind, think about these same things, to commune with the Lord at the Lord's table. Let's pray.